So the Lord threw me uh, a little bit of a curveball this morning, so he does that at time to time, and um, I'm grateful for it. So I was working on a message somewhere in here <laughs> all through the week, and, um, but this morning I just really felt like strongly that it wasn't for today, and um, I was like, okay, Lord, so... I just had to really just get quiet with God this morning. I get up early in, in, in the morning and, and just listen to him, and especially on Sundays. And, and uh, I don't know, I, it, it was interesting. But um, as I was getting quiet, he reminded me of something that happened a couple weeks ago, um, a dream I had. And um, I really felt strongly that I was supposed to share this dream. Many times... Um, occasionally the Lord will, for some reason, he speaks to me through dreams. I don't know if you're one of those, but, um, you know, and I'm grateful for that. And, but a lot of times I'm, I'm hesitant to share them dreams because it might not apply or it's, it's sometimes it's diff difficult to interpret. But this one was just something that has just kind of, it's wrecked me a little bit. So, um, ooh. See if I can get through it. But it was a series of two dreams. And um, the first was a dream of my dad. And I remember, oh boy, I hope I can get through it. It's, it's tough because even during worship this morning, I was just like, Wow, God was taking me back to that moment, so. Mm. But it was about my dad. And it was a time where it was, he came to visit me. It wasn't something that ever happened in my life, but it was at where I lived. He came to my house, and it was just an amazing time. It was, it was just natural. It was so healing. And there was just a time where we could just, just connect. And that doesn't always happen. And I have an amazing father, so I wouldn't want to discredit my father in any way because he is an incredible father. But comparative to our Heavenly Father, there's no words. And as I was spending time with, and it was my earthly dad that I was spending time with, but it was unusual because it was so healing. It was so amazing. And it was a time where I just wanted to just be with him and never have that situation be taken from me. I'm sorry, but it's just so powerful. And it came to a place where I had responsibilities that were pulling on me hardly, real hard. And I knew that I had to get back to the things that I needed to take care of, but I didn't want to separate with my dad because it was so refreshing. And there was such a connection just to place. And it was that I had to prepare for a funeral. There was a funeral that was taking place, and I knew that in my heart and in the dream, I knew that the funeral was going to happen very shortly and that I had to prepare for that funeral. And I knew that that responsibility was pulling on me hard. And I made the decision that I just had to tell my father, like, I have to go, Dad. I have to let you go because I have, some, I have this thing I have to take care of. And he, and he graciously accepted and, and left. But after he left, uh, I knew immediately in my heart that that was a mistake. 
It was an awful mistake. And I remember being alone and just being wrecked. Like, I just missed this incredible opportunity with God or with my father. And I didn't ever want it to, to, to pass by me. And I was overwhelmed with this wrong decision. And as I was trying to gather my thoughts and to, to collect myself just enough so I could do what I needed to do to get myself together, I just couldn't break that, that feeling of being overwhelmed and alone. So I called my wife on the phone and I told her, I said, I just can't go on no more. It's too much, it's too hard. Made too many wrong decisions. There's not enough in me to carry on. And it was the end of the dream. The question is, and this is a question for all of us today, is what in our life is, are we allowing to take away from our time with our Heavenly Father? Because in the dream, it seemed like, you know, ministry or whatever the case may be, it seems to fit. It seems like, well, that, that's, that's a good thing, right? Being there for people in their, in, the, in their hour of need. Extending ourselves. But if we do it, and sacrifice the very most important thing, the very best thing. And we all do this at times, don't we? We all, we all get up and we have this amazing moment to spend with our Father. This time to get alone and to be revitalized and to be healed because I could feel this healing happening and I could feel Lord, the, the, the Lord just touching me through my Father in that moment and just bringing clarity and, and bringing restoration and doing all these amazing things within my heart that I desperately need. But all of a sudden, there's distractions. There's interruptions. And we lose the very place that God has created for us. And we go about preparing our own funerals. And the responsibilities that we allow in this world might look noble, but we cannot fulfill that calling on our life until we can fulfill the first calling of being found alone with our Father. Our soul has a desperate need, an absolute desperate need for our first love. And without it, we are starved and depleted. Matthew says this, it's the words of Christ in, in Matthew 6, It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's our first responsibility as his children is to seek him to put him first in our life. I love what Pastor Jim said a few weeks ago. He says that a right relationship equals a right life. A right relationship equals a right life. But if we miss the first, we will excuse the second. And we have to make sure we place Christ first in our lives, very first. Above everything else, no matter what shape or form or agenda or idea or ideology or anything else that this world has to throw at us or the enemy has to throw at us, we have to place him first. Psalms 91 says this, and I love this, and it says, he who dwells, he who is found with his father in that secret place of the Most High. Do you dwell there? That's a place for his children. It's a place of privilege. And so often, we think of it as an obligation and not a privilege. We need to change that mindset, people. It's a place of the highest privilege to be able to be found with our creator 
the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. And it says, he who dwells in that secret place of the Most High, and this is, this is David, to share in his heart, sharing this, this moment of, uh, or this place that he has discovered where God has invited him, shall abide, shall live under the shadow of the Almighty. And when I think of that word shadow, and I was just thinking about it this morning, can't be under a shadow if you're not close to it. If you're distant from something, that shadow will never overshadow you. And the other thing you have to think about with the shadow is if you're above the object creating the shadow, you will never fall under that shadow. You have to be underneath it. You have to be beneath it. And when we exalt our own agendas and our own things above what God has for us, how can we be found under his shadow? We need to subject ourselves to what he has for us, his timetable, his, his will, not our will. Amen? Because he knows best. And as we sit under this shadow, there is a river that flows. And I can't explain it. Probably that's why God's making me emotional about it. The words can't express the abounding grace that flows. The river of life that God provides for each and every one of us. It's an essential of life. God is an essential worker. You hear that word being shared many times in today's society about I'm an essential worker. Well, the greatest essential worker of all is Christ Jesus. And that essential work is happening within his children that allow him to. So today is a day that we should make a covenant, a covenant to safeguard that time with him. Psalms 46.10 says this, to be still, to cease striving, to put away the things that distract us from him and to know that I am God. We need to get a little shutdown time, I believe. Even Elijah understood this some bit when he was on the mountain seeking God. And it said all these things happened, these earthquakes and storms and all of this chaos took place but it said that God was not found in any of those. But what he was found in it was that still silence, that still clear voice that he longed to hear. Because God is not a God of terror, a God of love. And I believe that voice was heard and felt through Elijah. The second part of this dream is after... That dream finished shortly after another dream pursued. And this time, I was in a classroom. So you teachers in the room might <laughs> understand this. And it seemed to be that I was a teacher, but I also was a student. So I would assume that I was probably a student teacher, obviously. Because I seemed like... This teacher uh, next to me was kind of evaluating and watching me. And I knew that I had uh, incredible material to, to, to teach my students. But for some reason, I was just overwhelmed and giving up. I felt not qualified, not adequate enough. And it was just, I was at the end. And in this dream, the teacher, this, this seasoned teacher, came right beside me and just calmly and lovingly just placed a bunch of cards. They were like flash cards down on, on, on the desk and said to me, if you can arrange these cards to make sense, you will hold the key to what is needed to be successful. 
So then it was kind of like, it's kind of where the, the dream goes a little weird, but you ever watch the Christmas Carol? And where um, um, Scrooge kind of goes into like a, a third person and he watches himself? So immediately from that point, I become a third person where I kind of just step out of the, out of the, the, the scenario or the, the setting for a moment. And I watch myself. As I watch myself at that desk, I see me pick up the cards and I'm working through the cards and shuffling through them and trying to lay them down in order. But the cards were facing away from me. And when the other me finished, I saw the, the sheer delight on, on his face. And immediately when, it, when he was finished, I started to fade out of the dream and I knew at that point it was a dream. I understood it clearly and I understood there was a message being given to me from God. But I also felt that who am I to understand the secret? Who am I to know what the secret to success is? I am surely not worthy of it. And as I was fading away, I just felt like I was just losing hope and losing confidence that I would ever know this dream. This, this statement or this key. And it was almost to the point where I was about to just heard this voice ask me, do you want to see the message? And I said, yes, very much so, with a sense of unbelief that I was even being asked this question. And immediately the message flashed before my eyes. It was like written across the sky, and, it, and I woke up. And it wasn't even until I woke up that I really understood or was even able to process the message because it happened so suddenly as I laid in bed and just thinking about it. You guys want to know what the message is? I'm going to pause just so you kind of feel that effect. It was just four simple words. And it just said, man of his word. That's all it said. And the truth is, we are unworthy of his word. We can earn it. We don't deserve it. There's nothing in us that makes us makes us in debt to God to give us it. But his, this is a reflection of him and of, of his thoughts and his ways. But in Isaiah, we know his thoughts and his ways are higher than our own. They're far above us. And the thing is, is I feel, in it, and when I'm referring to his word, a man of his word, it could be taken in so many ways. Not my word that I need to be a man of. It's to be a man of his word. And we take his word with such casualty at times. We're just careless with it. And Jesus gave us this illustration in Matthew when he gives us the parable of the foolish man and the wise man. And he said, basically, he says, the man who hears my word but doesn't do it is like a man who builds his house or his life on the sand. And when the storms of life come, great will that house fall. Great will be its disaster. But he also says, but the man who hears my word, not casually, but cherishes it and treasures it and, and, and deposits it down, deposits it down in his heart is like a wise man who constructs his life on it. And when the storms come, when the winds blow, when the seas rage and beat against that life, it will stand firm. It is built on a foundation that will never fail. I heard 
about a pastor in China just recently, and he went to China, and he was imparting to all of these people of China um, the word of God and sharing about Jesus Christ. And, 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 and what he come to find out was how incredibly well the Chinese people treasure God's word. He said at the end of his visit, he says, Here, let me leave you my Bible. Let me give you my Bible so you can study this. Even though it's outlawed, you just you keep this safe. Or parts of his Bible or tracts or copies. And the person that was given it says, no, you, you keep it. And he was shocked by it because he didn't realize what was happening. He's like, no, no, you need this. This is the word of God. This is something we cherish. I see your people cherishing it. I know you cherish it. And they're like, no, you don't understand. I already have that memorized. I know it. It's already been deposited within my heart. But we sometimes are so casual about this incredible gift that God has given us. We need to be aware of how great a value has been laid before us. Joshua it says this when the Lord talked to Joshua before he went into the promised land. He says, this book of the law, this word that I have given you shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Then you be, may be able to observe all that is written in it. And then, and then, he says, you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. The key is to treasure, to apply, and to value this gift God has given us right before us. Deuteronomy says the same thing. Blessings and cursings and life and death are laid before you, it says in Deuteronomy 30. He says, and you choose. I give you the choice. And we need to be better. I need to be better at this. So just as I'm sharing this with you, don't think I, this is something I need to work at. This was for me, but I believe for you as well. To get alone with our Father. To allow him to show how valuable and who we are and what he thinks of us. And then to dive into this word, into this promise, into these words spoken, these words of love spoken over his children, that it will breed life and it will breed blessing into our lives. It says, if you want those things, it says you will learn you to love the Lord your God, to obey his voice and to cling to him to cleave to him because he will be your life and the length of your days. So I hope this blessed you. It was tough to get through. But um, just realize the treasure God has for you. And make, be, be intentional to make time to be found alone with him. And when you do, there is a river of life that will meet you. And I believe it with all my heart.